everyone. This is Karen O'Hara, Director of Marketing and Communications with WorkCare. Welcome back for our 33rd uh, webinar on preventing and managing COVID-19 in the workplace. If this is your first time joining us, we're glad you can be a participant. And to those of you who join us every week, welcome back. And uh, thanks again for your interest. If you have topics you'd like us to address in the future, um, feel free to share them with us via the chat during the session. Um, we're thinking a lot about what to present over the holiday period when there's going to be added levels of stress and considerations for um, not just workplace exposure risk, but also personal exposure risk. As you know, we always record the session and post the recordings on our YouTube channel, and we post questions and answers on our website. Today, our question and answer period will probably last about 10 minutes at the conclusion of the formal presentation. Any questions we don't have time to answer in the time allowed, we'll answer in writing when we post it on the website. Our speaker is Anthony Harris, MD, MBA, MPH. Dr. Harris is board certified in occupational medicine. He's our chief innovation officer, and he's an associate medical director for on-site clinical operations. He's also our lead clinician for the, our COVID-19 response, and he's been our presenter every single week. We really appreciate it. So I'll turn it over to him. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Karen. And thanks, everyone, for joining once again. We're going to jump into it pretty quickly here because we have a lot of ground to cover today. Uh, you all know that I love presenting to you on the latest and greatest in terms of approach to prevention with regard to COVID and the workforce. Uh, today is a special one. We got a, we got a great one for you today. We're going to be talking about a uh, approach that uh, needs to improve in regards to what to do with our workforce and uh, contact tracing and testing, okay? Um, and we want to give a new approach uh, to uh, understanding how we can put in place things that are going to be protective for our workforce as we deal, continue to deal with spikes of COVID around the country. Uh, so uh, without further ado, let's get into it. Same format as usual. We'll start with our clinical update followed by micro and pathology. Uh, epidemiology, then prevention and workforce strategy from a work care standpoint. Uh, so when we talk about the clinical update for today, we're going to talk about uh, the clinical update as it pertains to hospitalized patients, because there have been some uh, nuances in approach uh, that have been approved since we last uh, met a week ago. And if we look at what has happened the FDA has approved the first drug for COVID-19 treatment. What does that mean, Harris? Well, that doesn't mean that we're going to get this drug to help uh, treat COVID if we're not hospitalized, one. And two, it's not a cure for COVID, okay? It's not an actual vaccine for COVID either. Doesn't mean it can prevent COVID. It just means that if you contract COVID and you are hospitalized uh, and you are in the right age range in terms of uh, your weight and, and the appropriateness of this medication, uh, then it can be given uh, to help prevent uh, severe outcomes. It doesn't help prevent death, uh, as uh, we've seen in some studies, but uh, if, if it's a testament to the drug's approval, uh, President Trump did receive this medication when he was symptomatic. Uh, and if we look at other biologic agents, because this is not the only biologic agent that's been approved by the FDA, um, but it's the first biologic agent that is a drug for COVID. Uh, there are other biologic agents that we've uh, seen approved earlier uh, by the FDA for emergency use authorization, uh, one of them being uh, convalescent plasma. We talked about this uh, briefly months ago, um, back when it was uh, first approved, um, but convalescent plasma has been given to hospitalized patients as well uh, and has been uh, associated with um, better outcomes with particularly ICU patients. Uh, so the clinical update uh, regarding hospitalized uh, individuals is a little bit rosy here in terms of uh, better helping those who become ill severely and hospitalized, weather the storm and, and make it to the other side of, 
of their infection. So now let's talk about from a pathology microbiology uh, update standpoint, let's talk about vaccines. We wanna give a vaccine update as we do routinely here uh, from time to time, um, because this is a continually evolving uh, science and, we, and process with regard to approval. And we have a lot to unpack today regarding vaccinations because it's important as we talk about vaccinations to understand when vaccinations are gonna come. We talked about that before, but more, more so who are the uh, hopefuls that are gonna get us a vaccine uh, if we look at the politics of it, maybe this year, right? Um, and that may be the case as we get into this, but again, available to the general public, we'll touch on that as an update as well. So uh, let's look at the phase three clinical trials only. We're not gonna go through obviously every candidate that's in the pipeline, but focus more so on the phase three clinical trials and give you updates there one by one. The first one we wanna talk about is a recombinant vaccine called AD5-NCoV. Uh, it was uh, approved uh, by the Chinese government to uh, be utilized and administered to their military. And that has been something that uh, so far has been uh, not, not seeing any adverse reactions, okay? Uh, so there, the government there has administered to their um, uh, military, but not to the general public as of yet. If we look at the next candidate, uh, AZD1222, uh, otherwise known as COVID Shield, uh, this one actually is on hold uh, in the U.S. In, in regard to its phase three clinical trial. We talked about this uh, some uh, weeks ago as AstraZeneca, um, because of adverse event side effects, um, uh, placed this trial on hold. And as it stands right now, it has not restarted in the U.S. Although um, in, in India, they're looking at restarting the clinical trial, but again, not yet here in the U.S. The next one on the list, CoronaVac, uh, is ongoing clinical trials phase three in Brazil, Turkey, and Indonesia. No serious side effects uh, to be seen yet, okay? Um, and this one uh, in particular has some hope uh, as an inactivated vaccine. Uh, there has been good response to an immunologic response uh, and immunity after being, been, um, being given this vaccine in the clinical study so far. The next one on the list is by Johnson & Johnson. Uh, it's a uh, one that we talked about here recently, the ensemble trial um, that is actually uh, still, uh, as of today, on hold, um, but resuming, okay? So we mentioned that they put theirs on hold after a severe event uh, in, in their phase three clinical trial. They are now considering restarting um, after a temporary pause. And so that is good news, obviously, uh, with the Jensen COVID-19 vaccine. We'll continue to follow that one as a hopeful. When we talk about the next one on the list, we mentioned Moderna, uh, at Moderna as a leader, and it still is. If we look at uh, their co-clinical study that's uh, already enrolled 25,000, uh, as of September 12th in the program, uh, it's doing uh, pretty well uh, without any severe side effects documented uh, to date. So we'll continue to follow this one in particular. UK uh, phase three clinical trials is ongoing for our next candidate, uh, NVX CoV-2373. This one uh, is uh, unique in its approach. It's an inactivated vaccine, but they've utilized nanoparticles uh, to uh, implement this particular vaccine. Uh, and, and in the phase three clinical trial, they have 10,000 planned enrollment. Uh, that began in September. Uh, they received $60 million here in the U.S. for manufacturing, uh, which is a positive as a result for us here in the U.S. Uh, and the government has promised them essentially $1.6 in additional funding if their phase three clinical trial continues to go well. Uh, with regard to efficacy and safety. So, and that's funded by Operation Warp Speed, which we mentioned months ago in regards to supporting accelerated um, approval of vaccinations here in the US. Uh, then the next one on the list um, it was, uh, it is uh, Novavax. Novavax in particular um, is, a, is one that, again, is utilizing nanoparticles. Uh, and this one uh, has been uh, moving forward. There's some hope there as well and we'll continue to watch that one. BCG um, is a vaccine that has been on the market 
um, uh, and utilized for tuberculosis in multiple countries. And now there's phase three clinical trials in multiple countries looking at is BCG going to be a hopeful for preventing uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2. So far, the data is showing no. There's very little effect in terms of prevention, and there's no effect on mortality. So this one is not looking so hopeful in terms of leveraging BCG. And then lastly on the list, we have Pfizer. Uh, Pfizer was a hopeful we, we mentioned a couple of weeks ago uh, in phase three clinical trials, 32,000 uh, participants. Uh, and they are anticipating a potential application for emergency use authorization in November. And they can be approved in as soon as December. And this is the one that uh, um, we believe is um, uh, meeting that timeline that the politics, politics uh, have purported, right? Uh, if we look at other approvals uh, moving forward with this particular one around the world, Australia has moved this one to a what's called provisional determination status. And we'll break that down a little bit because uh, in the media that has been shown to be something super positive and hey, it's going gonna, it's gonna to hit the market sooner than we thought. Uh, and, and let's dig into that. But uh, if we look at that particular pathway in Australia, uh, we can see that uh, what has already been, been already happened and been approved by the Australian uh, um, uh, uh, regulators is this provisional determination. Okay, um, and in particular, this de uh, uh, determination can take up to uh, 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 twelve, or excuse me, twenty twenty weeks, right? Um, but uh, this particular one uh, has already met criteria, and they've moved past this. Um, with the TGA, which is the Therapeutics Good Administration in Australia. If we look at the next steps then, that's an important uh, to, to let us know, is this close to approval or is this not so close to approval in, in Australia in particular? This, the, these next couple of phases and milestones uh, is what's happening now, right? So the uh, pre-submission meeting uh, is moving forward, but that's a three month uh, uh, um, prospective timeline to apply there. One month after that, uh, we have a determination, and then we move forward with uh, several milestones that at the end of the day, we won't walk through each of them, but at the end of the day, uh, each of these milestones uh, can add up a considerable amount of time. And at, uh, if we look at it in some total, it's going to be at least 12 months um, uh, before this uh, particular vaccine is approved, in, in particularly in, in Australia, okay? So uh, it looks like it, it, we're not going to get a lot of help in terms of accelerated pathway for this medication uh, abroad, and the U.S. will likely approve it first. So these are my uh, top picks for contenders, uh, Pfizer, Moderma, and Novax, Novax being the one that is utilizing nanoparticles as well. And these are, are, have moved forward uh, without, uh, with, with good efficacy in terms of immunogenicity um, after uh, administration of either one or two doses uh, and a little side effect profile in terms of severe reactions. So we'll continue to uh, follow these and give you updates as such. And just as a reminder, as we updated this uh, timeline that I put forth here a couple weeks ago, not until mid-May, early June of next year, uh, are we going to see a vaccine in the hands of your providers, in the hands of uh, the workforce in terms of being able to administer uh, at least the first dose, right? We know that most of these vaccines will have a two-dose regimen, uh, the initial dose and then a booster to capture as many people as possible in terms of having a building a immune response. Uh, and that time gap is anywhere from 14 days to 30 days between doses. So that gives you a good understanding of where we're at with regard to vaccines. Now, to give you kind of a look forward as what we're gonna be talking about next week or the coming weeks, uh, we wanna give you an update to the in vitro diagnostics because we talked about these early on and saw the list build in terms of diagnostic tests that have been used to diagnose or at least do surveillance for COVID-19. And if we look at the number now, and this is what's causing still a consternation of uh, issues, a constellation of issues, excuse me, uh, for testing in the US, there's now over 287 entries, uh, meaning FDA emergency uh, use authorized tests that have been deployed in the US. 
And so when we talk about sensitivity and specificity and accuracy and who got what test and what does that actually mean for a clinical algorithm, it's a mess. So we're gonna delve back into this more fully uh, in the coming weeks the next, uh, in the coming weeks so that we can more deeply understand how to make sense of and apply logic to these uh, plethora of tests that are now available and being utilized in the general public and the workforce. So let's get into some of the epidemiology now um, as it pertains to COVID. And we're gonna look at um, uh, a little bit differently uh, what's happening here in the US. Total cases, we're at 8.6 million. Uh, and if we look at the number of cases um, uh, per capita, per 100,000 uh, people, right, over the last seven days, rolling day average, it's 21.2, okay? And those countries, or those countries, those states being hit the hardest, as you can see, those northern states that once were very low in count with COVID, if we look at it now, uh, fast forward to today through the lens of per capita are seeing the highest rates uh, of COVID uh, spread. Uh, and it uh, obviously from a death uh, standpoint uh, per uh, uh, in the seven day rolling average per 100,000, we're seeing that mirrored as well uh, at 0.2 deaths uh, per 100,000. So uh, we know that COVID is now obviously affected every state, affecting communities that weren't were, were not affected by COVID. And we're seeing that reflected from the feedback from you all, our clients. Uh, and so we're gonna give you again, strategies to hopefully keep your people safe um, from a workplace exposure standpoint, as we're seeing community transmission rates skyrocket. Now, are we alone, right? Are we seeing this in isolation here in the US? Or are we seeing a spike globally in terms of uh, impact of COVID-19? You probably have heard recently that Paris is under a curfew that started about a week ago. Uh, and their curfew is centered upon uh, trying to control an uptick in coronavirus outbreak that they're seeing. And so you see in the news, um, the state of emergency that's been declared uh, with rising cases. And if we look at the details of this particular curfew, it's centered around nightclubs and bars being shut down. So the curfew in place is from 9 p.m. till 6 a.m. local time there. And the transmissions that were traced to these spikes uh, is in a particular younger demographic. And uh, it's thought that having this curfew in place will uh, stem the tide of exposures and transmissions that were happening. And we want to learn from this, right? We want to look abroad to see how uh, our, our colleagues abroad from a public health standpoint, from a workforce safety standpoint, are responding to spikes because this might also give us insights to what, we're, what to expect uh, here in the US, right? Uh, and, and so if we look at then and ask the question, uh, what's happening abroad, let's look at the numbers from a uh, per million uh, population standpoint, seven day rolling average, daily new cases. We can see that the UK in particular, and we'll zero in on them in a couple of minutes here, uh, has been hit harder recently than the US, right? If, if we look at this from a per capita standpoint. Uh, if we add to that now France, we can clearly see why France and Paris is shutting down um, because they are above and beyond uh, even that of the UK, all right? Uh, and if we look at the actual numbers, they're at 586 as, as of uh, a couple days ago here, uh, or as of today, excuse me, 586 um, in, in that per capita per million. Uh, whereas here in the US, we're at 218. So they're being hit very hard. And at those levels, if we, can, if we continue to rise to those levels, we're gonna see more and more reversals of these states opening uh, that have opened uh, and be in a similar situation, right? So that's what we can glean from what's happening abroad in terms of their impact and what to expect here in the US in terms of regulatory uh, um, uh, new, new standards uh, of whether or not our people can show up to work if they're not essential or whether people can actually leave their homes. And we'll give you a little insight to, to those notions here in, in a second. Uh, so let's look at uh, a, a couple of days ago where we were, um, a couple of weeks ago, excuse me, uh, where we were with regard to COVID cases and on a seven day rolling average uh, daily, uh, we see the US again, uh, neck and neck with India, 
uh, and getting closer as we looked at it last week. And this week, we want to kind of uh, dial it back in terms of our perspective and look more specifically at several uh, countries that uh, are, are the most uh, at the top of the um, top of the heap in terms of uh, impact from COVID and, and see how we're doing from a daily new cases. Uh, and we can see the U.S. here is, again, vacillating back and forth with India in terms of daily new cases, some total. Now, again, remember, this is not per capita. Uh, this is total number of daily new cases, and we're still at the top there uh, with India. If we look at deaths, uh, we saw the uh, flattening of our uh, death, realizing that it was going to uptick a little bit as it did uh, last week with the lagging in, as a lagging indicator uh, by 30 days or so. Uh, from as compared to the, the new cases or total cases. And then today, as we zero in again on those uh, uh, hardest hit uh, nations, we can see that even from a death perspective, U.S. is up there with India. Uh, but quickly, France and the U.K. are, uh, if you look at their um, rate and their trajectory, are approaching uh, that of the U.S. and India. All right. Uh, and that's total. That's not per capita. That's total. So the impact there uh, is far more significant in regards to what they're experiencing from COVID-19 mortality standpoint. If we look at share of daily positive tests, we have been tracking this uh, over time. We knew that the U.S. was on an upward trajectory a couple weeks ago, continued to be on, on an upward trajectory a couple uh, as of last week and the week prior. And uh, if we look at an update as of uh, last week, we saw that sharply increased and continue to increase this week in terms of daily new tests that are positive. Let's uh, isolate the US and you can see the uh, rate of increase of our positive share uh, of, of tests uh, as we are moving forward here. Now, again, we always wanna answer um, you know, the exact number here for you in terms of the US we're at 7.3% compared to Italy at 8.5 and Spain at 11.4. Uh, but let's answer the question of total number of tests. Uh, are we continuing to be flat in terms of number of tests? Or are we declining? Are we increasing the number of tests? Obviously, we want to increase the number of tests uh, that we can do on a daily uh, seven-day rolling average, um, but we have not as of uh, the, the last couple of weeks. So two weeks ago, we were kind of flat. We declined a little bit as we crested over a million tests uh, on a daily average. And if we look at it today, zero in again on those nations uh, deeply affected. Uh, the U.S. Uh, has dipped a little bit more uh, as of today. But again, that dip uh, hopefully will come back up uh, over the next couple of days. And it's just the variability that we're seeing in terms of capacity from a day-to-day -day basis of testing uh, here in the U.S. So as we talk about learning from abroad and what's happening, uh, particularly France and the U.K., uh, and the numbers that we just showed, we want to, again, uh, highlight what's happening abroad so that we can try to anticipate what may happen here and why. OK, so the UK also is shut down uh, uh, in certain areas because of the drastic uh, uh, spikes that they're seeing and have seen in the recent weeks here. Uh, and if we look at particularly uh, what the uh, government has done from uh, the prime minister and his approach uh, and what the regions have chosen to do, there are some drastic changes uh, with regard to impact to uh, just regular day life and social activities. Uh, and they've approached it from a tiered system. So let's talk about that. Um, their tiered system in the UK um, is threefold, tier one, two, and three. And if we look at what the first tier um, uh, is, is, has promulgated uh, from a protectionism standpoint, uh, it's considered a medium level uh, where the restrictions are in place that are nationwide, right? And no more than six people can meet uh, in a pub or a restaurant, and the pub or restaurant can, has to close down by 10 p.m. If we look at the second tier bracket, considered high alert category, uh, then in, in indoor social mixing, uh, even between households, uh, it is banned. And pubs uh, that don't serve meals, meaning they're not a restaurant, uh, are closed, okay? And that's the high level. If we're looking at the very high level alert, that third tier, uh, then we're, we're shutting down even further, mixing between households, uh, both indoors and outdoors. Pubs and bars are forced to close unless they operate solely as restaurants and they, they don't serve alcohol other than with the meal, okay? And so 
uh, as we look to the level of uh, impact abroad and we look to the response abroad, uh, we can anticipate if our levels continue to increase uh, to, to uh, on par levels, here's what we're looking at potentially on a national scale, not just isolated pockets. So let's dig into that a little bit more by the numbers, okay? So if we look at the daily new cases per capita now, thousand uh, per thousand people in the UK, they're at the top there, right along with France, right? So let's go in order, UK, uh, then France, Canada, Spain, Italy, right? And then the US. So if we look at uh, daily new COVID tests, per, I'm sorry, I said, uh, I, I think I said, I may have referred to this as a chart looking at uh, cases. Again, this is tests per thousand people because we want to understand uh, how, who is under, who is articulating the burden of illness in the particular country uh, the most accurately, okay? So let's let's jump back here, right? So they put these measures in place. They understand, we wanna know how well they understand the burden of illness uh, in their country. And we wanna see as a comparison, how deeply we understand and maybe articulating the burden of disease here in the US, right? So at the top is the UK. Now, right behind them is France. Those are the two countries that have the most severe restrictions currently in place as a result of rising numbers that they've seen. So again, compare that to where we stand here in the US, uh, we're, we're number six in terms of uh, the daily new tests per thousand people, which means we may not be as accurately articulating the burden of illness and lagging in our approach to help prevent illness because we don't have the most accurate data, right? So that's something to think about. But yet and still, what do we see happening? here in the US state to state. Uh, we've seen this chart before, we'll present it again today because it's updated and changing. Um, we are seeing more states now reversing their open policy uh, with regard to uh, social gatherings, restaurants, et cetera. Okay, so let's dig into an example. Uh, my home state, Illinois, I'm here in Chicago. Uh, we see that Prisker, our governor, implemented measures back in the summer uh, and also here in late October um, that ordered closure of bars um, that do not serve food on an essential, on a non-essential basis, right? Um, 10 p.m. is the shutdown till 6 a.m. So does that look familiar? Obviously the answer is yes, uh, because we see the spike here in Illinois uh, over the last couple of weeks uh, accelerate. So when we look at uh, a non-democratic uh, state, because we wanna make sure that we're not seeing a, posit a partisan uh, phenomenon, we're seeing even in a Republic state like, Republican state like Idaho, same approach, right? The governor has recognized the spike over recent weeks uh, and put in place and, and stopped fully opening uh, the, the state uh, and have moved back to phase three, okay? Where nightclubs uh, have limited capacity and some businesses may not be able to operate uh, because uh, of the, the spikes that they're seeing, okay? So we know that it's happening abroad. Obviously, they're a little ahead of us in terms of impact. And if we continue to see the impact here in the US, these type of events where states are shutting down again, uh, is gonna continue to move in that direction. And we have to have, therefore, a, pos a po policy in place, an approach in place that's gonna help protect our workforce uh, in escalated community transmissions and uh, in a way that uh, will prevent our businesses from being shut down. So what does that look like? Will it be sustainable? Uh, obviously we'll be dealing with COVID again uh, for some time to come until end of 2021 uh, for sure. So it comes down to uh, a couple of things. First being testing approach, right? We wanna revisit this. Uh, testing uh, has and still is a mainstay for preventative measures with regard to folk who have to show up uh, because they're essential workers or those uh, industries that have uh, sought to move forward with reopening more fully, uh, such as the TV, uh, TV and um, uh, movie industry. Um, so let's talk about what these approaches look like and the new norm that we presented previously uh, is gonna likely be in place to the end of 2021 where we're doing screening on a daily basis. Again, that's consistent with uh, CDC recommendations from a symptomatic standpoint, uh, keeping people at home who need to be home and then COVID testing uh, in the individual that uh, has access to COVID testing um, and particularly local testing if available 
And then the return to work process obviously is going to be essential for preventing uh, substantial absenteeism as a result of COVID. Uh, and we want to revisit this uh, shift from a case-based, cumulative case-based approach uh, of, you know, looking at our risk zones uh, as we stratify risk at a local level, right, a community-based uh, approach. Uh, we shifted to then a uh, daily case per 100,000 uh, uh, strata. And we had to, frankly, because the burden of illness was so significant in most communities at this point looking at a cumulative uh, perspective was not useful and not helpful. So as we move to this daily case um, uh, rate, we wanna understand then what do we need to add to our approach for testing uh, based upon these particular strata of doing, again, at the bottom tertiary uh, prevention, when we're talking about testing to do a return to work uh, after someone is already out, secondary prevention where we're doing testing as soon as somebody becomes symptomatic or has been exposed um, to the primary prevention of testing at, at, at a level of surveillance, those who are asymptomatic and have not had any exposure history, and we're trying to keep people safe from a, a primary prevention standpoint, right? The, the top tier is what's happening in the TV and media industry. The top tier is what's happening in universities that have kept uh, their students uh, at low numbers of incidents uh, of transmission, right? Uh, and so we've got to understand, is there another way to look at this that's more sustainable for the workforce at a, at a cost point that's not going to make it prohibitive to do primary preventative approaches uh, uh, workforce-wide, okay? And so we believe that pool testing will be the future of COVID-19 workplace surveillance, right? It only makes sense. Pool testing will be more cost-effective, uh, we've talked about pool testing before. We'll mention it again here because pool testing allows us to do some on-site testing that's not cost prohibitive, right? And so we need to continue to focus on uh, doing and, and striving for continuous surveillance of the workforce that's both sustainable and has high worker participation. But it has to be different than testing every worker every day or every week because, again, that uh, approach can be uh, cost prohibitive, as well as administratively a nightmare to try to undertake from a logistical standpoint. So let's give some new thought to that as we look forward to dealing with COVID until the end of 2021. As a reminder, pool testing then is taking a subset of people, uh, the workforce, and grouping them in a number of anywhere from 10 to 20 up to 50, depending on the local incidence uh, of uh, COVID-19, and uh, testing them only in one well, so to speak, right? Uh, and so you can test a huge number of work, uh, workers um, in a small aliquot uh, of a sample, which makes it more cost uh, effective, right? To look at it another way, again, we take uh, one master pool, we divide that out uh, into different uh, uh, groups of individuals. And then at, at the next tier, we take those groups of individuals uh, who have a positive result and retest them, right? Um, and that retest then tells us who in that group uh, may be positive. That's called the adaptive pool testing method. Um, what, we're, what we presented before, the non-adaptive pool testing method, uh, takes uh, individuals, puts them into several different pools, and uses stochastic um, uh, equations to determine who was the individual that was positive and out of, that, uh, out of those multiple pools that were created. Uh, and that approach, again, uh, decreases the amount of time to get to a, an actual result, diagnostic type result, and may increase still the efficiency of our uh, testing protocols in, in regards to pool testing. So we know pool testing exists. We know it's been out there. We know that FDA has approved uh, pool testing for uh, the general public and for the workforce. And we know that there are regulatory hurdles that we need to address with regard to being able to do pool testing and we can talk in more depth about uh, how we deploy this in the workplace uh, with, CLIA, um, with, with CLIA requirements, right? CLIA being the standard for doing testing on site at the point of care. But just realize there is a pathway forward to be able to uh, do this effectively uh, and not cost, prohibit cost prohibitively, right? Uh, and, and when we talk about then uh, being able to do this and report for screening, Right? We know that we can't report to an individual until we become uh, uh, at the level of a diagnostic test. So just keep that in mind as, as we talk about 
putting together a strategy to help uh, long term deal with how we prevent do primary prevention in the workplace and your workforce. Um, we, we can do so effectively by uh, uh, creating pools of individuals, sub-segments of individuals um, that are, are subject to uh, screening and then furthermore, diagnostic testing. And we're gonna continue and double down on that approach, right? Uh, and that's the nuance of what we wanna address today when we talk about uh, uh, then uh, putting in place something that uh, takes testing as a strategy and combines it with um, exposure as a strategy. And when we talk about exposure and exposure risk, uh, we're talking more about uh, a contact tracing, right? But we're, again, we're talking about it in a nuanced way here as we want to present it. So if we look at what's happened with regard to exposure and, FD, uh, and CDC recommendations, they have updated their guidance here recently, uh, particularly around what, it, what the definition of exposure is. Right. The definition of exposure as it stands now is an individual who has close contact within six feet for a total, the nuance there, of 15 minutes or more. So this means uh, in particular that uh, it's not just, hey, we hung out for 15 minutes continually uh, and that uh, flags me uh, if I've been within six feet as an exposed individual. Right. It means that I can hang out with someone for two minutes. Uh, during the day, and then another five minutes during the day, then another, et cetera, et cetera, right? And once that total hits 15 minutes for that day, then my then I am considered exposed, uh, and that is an actual exposure, okay? So uh, again, when we talk about exposure to whom we're talking about from a CDC perspective, an individual that uh, has had symptoms for a period of two days before uh, and prior to the uh, discontinuing home isolation, all right? Um, and, and then when we talk about laboratory confirmed or clinically compatible, both of those fit into that category. If we look at then somebody who has tested positive uh, for COVID-19, they too are obviously considered uh, someone that uh, uh, is, is, uh, amp, uh, is possible to commit, uh, excuse me, transmit uh, the virus here. And, and so we want to, the CDC does include them as well uh, in the criteria uh, for, an exposed, uh, for an exposure. Uh, the nuance here from CDC is that it doesn't matter whether or not you're wearing a mask, it doesn't matter whether or not the person who has the illness uh, was wearing a mask, it's still considered a positive exposure, okay? Um, and that uh, right there should give you butterflies. Uh, and if not, uh, we'll explain why it should. Uh, and the reason is because then the result and the recommendation uh, of these exposures then is to quarantine for 14 days. Uh, to self-monitor, uh, as you're familiar with, and watch for symptoms of COVID, and then avoid contact, meaning that if you're avoiding contact and you're, isolate, you're, you're quarantining, you're not at work, okay? And if you, we follow these recommendations wholeheartedly, uh, we're going to put a lot of people out of work, right? And so was this the intent of uh, CDC when they made these recommendations? Uh, we believe the answer is no. Uh, because these recommendations are for community-related exposure, uh, not work-related exposure, right? So we have to be, and, and, and in particular, when we talk about work-related exposure versus community-related exposure, and does the CDC parse out definitions for both, the answer is no. This is all we got, right? Uh, we do have definitions for essential workforce like healthcare workers, in particular healthcare workers, uh, because they encounter people with COVID and care for them with proper PPE in place every day, right? And, and they're not sent uh, for, for a 14-day quarantine period. Um, so we have to be nuanced in our approach um, as we consider the workforce and whether or not they should be sent for uh, a quarantine period after a potential exposure wearing masks or not wearing a mask, right? Um, and so let's zoom into the next piece of this and putting it all together. We talked about exposure tracking, contact tracing previously from a uh, historian perspective, interviewing individuals, uh, asynchronous automation, tracking individuals with historic data and synchronous automation, uh, actual live uh, uh, contact tracing and physical distancing uh, alerts, if you would, right? And we're gonna, we're gonna um, uh, focus particularly on the uh, data, the objective data, not the interview uh, process, because that uh, obviously is limited in the terms of proximity of close uh, exposure. But if we have data that we're collecting, that we're able to collect 
uh, for individuals in the workforce through a device, right? Um, we want to be able to utilize that data in a novel way, okay? And that's what it's all about in terms of uh, exposure uh, estimation and risk estimation. So uh, using the asynchronous approach or using um, the, uh, the synchronous approach as I jump through things here in the interest of time, uh, we know that um, there are multiple devices out there that are available that can uh, track movement of your workforce. And uh, in some cases, again, give real-time alerts to those individuals who have come in close contact with another individual in the workplace, right? Uh, and we want to be able to leverage this data, not just for the historic contact tracing um, that we've talked about before, but we want to leverage this data um, in a new way that allows us to then uh, further delineate those individuals who, uh, in conjunction with testing, will be uh, uh, protected uh, from a primary preventative strategy, right? And so if we talk about what happens now with contact tracing, those who uh, we have this data on that have been exposed to someone uh, historically will be uh, um, sent for testing, right? And that's hopefully what happens uh, if testing is available consistently uh, when a close contact occurs. But what we want to move to now is then uh, shifting our perspective of looking at this data, right? That Now that we know who has been in close contact with someone else, and we have the ability to trace individuals' um, um, whereabouts or proximities to others over time, we want to do this in a momentary fashion only, right? And this gets past some of the barriers we're seeing with clients that uh, have not been able to deploy this type of technology because of privacy concerns from the workforce. And what we've seen play out in deployments of uh, similar type uh, of technology, big data technology, is that if we tell workers, look, we're not going to continuously monitor you. We only want to sample uh, the workforce and then capture those individuals who have continuous close contacts with others and put them in a particular risk stratification, right? And that's, that's the opportunity here to leverage this type of approach and this type of data so that we're now uh, categorizing individuals in the workforce uh, at low risk for close contact, at low risk for exposure, right? Because we have objective data over, maybe it's a week, maybe it's several weeks, uh, to show that their potential exposure to someone with COVID is decreased because their actual close proximity to other workers during the normal course of their job has been demonstrated objectively to be little, right? Or they're medium risk because um, their uh, contact within six feet uh, of someone else is in a, at the next tier, uh, next tier of uh, frequency, and then finally high risk because their level of contact and close proximity uh, is frequent and unavoidable in some cases. And those, uh, and from that approach, then we're able to apply then our uh, additional stratification from our testing perspective, right? Uh, of only testing from a surveillance standpoint, those individuals who are either moderate or high risk, or perhaps only high risk only. Right, and, and so in doing so, we're taking data that has been historically deployed in a um, tertiary uh, preventative fashion, right? After someone has been exposed and we're able to do classic contact tracing, we're using that data now and translating it into primary prevention by combining it with our surveillance approach uh, because we're creating a new risk stratified uh, work, workforce for potential exposure. Right, and so that's what we want to move towards continually, getting to that green zone of prevention where we're helping prevent that exposure from ever happening in the first place uh, because we're surveillancing uh, those individuals who are at greatest risk, thus making our program more sustainable, more, more cost effective, and obviously a bigger bang for your buck from return on investment, uh, and hopefully the biggest preventative opportunity for our workforce across the board. So I know we covered a lot. We filled up the full 45 minutes here, um, but I'll stop there and let's get into the questions. Thank you. Dr. Harris, that was a whirlwind. And for those of you who joined us a little late, um, we're not gonna have time to answer a lot of questions, but we do answer all the questions in the Q&A that we post on our website. One question related to your presentation and the ROI how would you compare these strategies to other permanent changes that may need to be made with respect to social distancing? For example, changes in production lines. 
changes in retail functions, you know, how many people are allowed within a space, within a certain proximity of each other. There's so many workplaces where there's close contact routinely where they now need to think about the long-term social distancing strategy. Sure. So we can look at that question in twofold with two different metrics. We can look at it from the perspective of return on investment, right, ROI, and then we can also look at it from a perspective of effectiveness. Let's take the, uh, the latter first. So effectiveness wise, those things mentioned in the question, setting up barriers, changing formally how the manufacturing layout actually is, changing the retail layout in a permanent fashion, those are engineering controls, right? And we know if we look at the hierarchy of uh, industrial hygiene and our, that pyramid, that engineering controls are the best and most effective at preventing the exposure, in this case to COVID-19, uh, that uh, can be deployed in the, work for, in the workforce, right? So by far and away, if we're going for effectiveness, those permanent changes uh, are going to be the go-to uh, for dealing with COVID long-term, right? Now, if we look at and try to answer the question of ROI, then that becomes a business decision and it's all predicated on how much is the capital outlay potentially to redo your manufacturing. It could be a million dollars or it could be a hundred million dollars or even more, right? And so the barrier to perform engineering controls has historically been cost. And if the cost is not prohibitive, then that's going to be the number one go-to for effectiveness. And then you march down from engineering controls to administrative controls, and finally to the level of the strategy that we presented here today, which is uh, a bit of administrative control in that we're going to put into surveillance programs those people at highest risk and uh, do uh, testing, hopefully pool testing on them uh, to help prevent exposure, as well as, admit, uh, as well as behavioral control which is, has been shown to be the least effective, right? Uh, work, actual worker behavioral control in terms of protection is the least effective, the least ROI. But uh, in this case, we still wanna deploy it, uh, in those, particularly in those cases where the engineering controls at the top of the hierarchy are too cost prohibitive uh, to perform. Too bad people aren't more compliant because it's the lowest cost, but the hardest to get cooperation. Um, okay, we have, just one quick clarification regarding the change in the CDC close contact definition, because it used to say 24 hours, but now it's not really clear. Do you know if it applies to one 24 hour period or just to when you might have been exposed to someone within the last few days? Sure, we believe it's still cumulative to a 24 hour period, even though that is not there, right? Because um, if you look at exposure from a 15 minute standpoint, right, is it 15 minutes uh, from an exposure that happened a week ago uh, and it's cumulative to what just happened uh, today or yesterday? Uh, or is it even greater, right? A, a month here and a month, uh, and, and this month I was exposed for another five minutes and another five minutes next month. So we, we have to give perspective to that uh, proximity and, and exposure risk and the 24 hour period still makes the most clinical sense from an inoculation standpoint, right? Um, and, and so that's what we still consider and hold as a standard. Okay, thank you for that. Um, we're out of time, but again, I wanna encourage you all to visit our website um, to review the slides. You can check our YouTube channel. It's Work Care on YouTube, easy to find. And um, we'll look forward to having you joining us again next week. Have a happy, safe Halloween. Thank you, Dr. Harris. Thank you, everyone. Please stay safe during the holidays, and we'll give some specific strategies as we move forward through Thanksgiving and uh, the Christmas holiday season as well. Thank you so much. God bless.